Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the first quarterly report for 2020 conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during this session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. I must advise you that this conference is being recorded today, Friday the 3rd of April 2020. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Helena Helmerson, CEO. Please go ahead, madam. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. We hope that you are well in these challenging times. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to this telephone conference about the H&M Group's three-month results 2020 and our update on the impact of the coronavirus situation. With me today is our CFO, Adam Carlson, and Head of Investor Relations, Nils Vinge, and we will do our best to answer your questions. You will find the three-month report on hnmgroup.com Investor Relations. We have never been through times as demanding as these. Things are happening extremely fast and extraordinary public measures have been taken to contain the coronavirus. This has put people, communities and companies in an exceptional situation. We are working very hard in the H&M Group to manage the challenges in the best possible way. Our First priority is the safety of our employees and customers, and we are cooperating fully with the authorities. Because of the dramatically weaker market and its negative effect on our sales, we are forced to make difficult decisions and also take radical action. I am convinced that as a company having taken the right measures to get through this tough period, we will continue to stand strong. With customers all over the world, amazing employees and sound finances, we are well positioned to do so. Looking at the first quarter, our profits more than doubled. The strong increase is the result of a much appreciated assortment with the best combination of fashion, quality, price, and sustainability. Our initiatives to improve the customer offering and the customer experience continue to drive full price sales, leading to lower markdowns and also an improved inventory level. This positive trend, which was there already in 2019, shows that our improvements are effective and that our long-term investments are paying off. Sales increased with 8% in Swedish kronor and 5% in local currencies. Online sales were up 48% in SIC and 44% in local currencies. In the second half of the quarter, growth was held back by the rapid outbreak of coronavirus, particularly in China, where sales declined by 84% in February. Excluding China, Hong Kong, Singapore, Macau, Japan, and Taiwan, sales increased by 7% in local currency. Now, Turning to the current quarter, naturally, the corona situation is having a huge negative effect on our second quarter. As of 31st of March, 3,778 of our 5,065 stores were temporarily closed in a total of 54 markets. Since mid-March, all our stores have been closed in several of our largest markets, including Germany, the U.S., the U.K., France, Italy, and Spain. Because of the pandemic, demand has weakened in many other markets, too. 
net sales in the month of March decreased by 46% in local currencies. In China, however, uh, we are seeing a gradual recovery. Our digital channels remain open in 47 of 51 markets, and in uh, March, our online sales grew by 17% in local currency. With each day uh, that we must keep stores closed, the situation is getting tougher. To lessen the negative impact, we are taking a range of forceful measures in areas such as purchasing, investments, rent, and staffing. All parts of the business are included and all costs are being reviewed. We are adjusting our purchases and our buying plans. Inventory is expected to increase temporarily, but we expect levels to start normalizing again once demand is coming back. Investments are being scaled back. Planned CapEx for the year has been revised down from 8.5 billion to 5 billion. In 2019, CAPEX was 10 billion. In the second quarter, we estimate that a reduction of approximately 20 to 25 percent will be possible in operating costs, excluding depreciation, based on the information we have now. This estimate is subject to some uncertainty, though. Regrettably, this will also require a reduced working hours in our affected markets, and tens of thousands of our employees will be affected. This will be carried out in accordance with the laws applicable in each country. Meanwhile, senior executive salaries will be cut by 20% for three months. We are also reviewing the need for any redundancies. Rental costs are being reduced through turnover-based rents and rent reliefs from certain governments. We are awaiting possible additional rent reliefs based on dialogue with landlords and authority decisions in connection with the store closures in many markets. In addition, all other operating costs are reduced to absolute minimum levels. The second quarter will, however, be loss-making as the sudden drop in sales is too significant to be balanced by the cost savings. In the light of all this, I welcome the board's decision to propose to the 2020 annual general meeting that the dividend is cancelled. I share the board's view that this is the best thing to do for our company. We are fortunate to have a strong balance sheet and to further strengthen our liquidity buffer, we are also evaluating and preparing a number of sources of financing. The extraordinary situation we are in will have severe consequences for many companies, both in our sector and others. Dialogue between companies and governments is more important than ever, and the H&M Group appreciates the various support measures that governments have introduced to ease the cost burden on companies in the markets concerned. In our view, though, further measures will be needed. The H&M Group wants to help in the fight against corona, and we have temporarily switched parts of our suppliers' production to making personal protective equipment for hospital staff. The H&M Foundation is also supporting the COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund, which started uh, by WHO and partners in order to contribute to understanding the spread of the virus, making protective equipment available, and speeding up development uh, of a vaccine. People and communities are under great strain, 
And of course, so are we as a company. For the moment, we are acting on the rapid changes around us while ensuring that we have the best customer offering at all our brands. To ensure our long-term development, it is important that we also continue to look forward. Our strong momentum until the coronavirus' global outbreak shows that we have a firm foundation to build on. We believe that the big change in consumer behavior that we are seeing now will further speed up the rapid digitalization of our industry. We also believe that focus on sustainability will grow even stronger since the need for business resilience has become very clear. Both these areas will play important parts in our transformation work going forward. With our committed employees, strong culture and unique brands, the H&M Group will continue to stand strong. We have what it takes to weather this storm, and once we have, we will continue to renew ourselves, build customer relationships, and drive sustainable change. Thank you very much, and now we're happy to take your questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. As a reminder, if you do wish to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. If you wish to cancel your request, please press the hash key. Once again, if you do wish to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone. Your first question comes from the line of Chiara Bastini from JP Morgan. Please ask your question. Good morning. Thank you very much for taking my questions. I have uh, a couple, please. Uh, the first one would be on uh, how to think about inventories versus promotional activity coming in the next few quarters. Uh, how are you thinking about the orders for the auto winter um, with the suppliers and also about the, uh, the excess stock in terms of promotional activity in Q2 versus the second half of the year? That would be my first question. And then on the second question about your liquidity versus the working capital requirements and also the number of weeks your stores can actually stay closed, how should we be thinking about this piece? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, when it comes to the inventory, um, as soon as we uh, saw uh, and started to understand uh, how the virus could affect us, we started to take measures, meaning that we adjusted uh, our purchasing and our plans uh, going forward. Uh, when looking at the first quarter, we see that we um, uh, had a result of minus 12 on in inventory levels, and of course, during the second quarter, uh, that will uh, go up. Uh, that also means that we probably will have to work with uh, more uh, reductions, but we see this as something uh, temporarily uh, and will, of course, uh, try to get inventory levels uh, uh, down as soon as possible after that quarter. But it's all depending, of course, on the situation and what happens going forward. Uh, when it comes to the second question and the number of weeks, um, I think uh, no one can really tell uh, about the development going forward. I think the best thing we can do is to do what we have done so far, meaning taking measures and acting fast. Um, we have done so when it comes to uh, costs uh, of different sorts. Uh, and we will continue to do, do so if the situation continues, but also have a plan uh, for opening up if that would be the scenario going forward. Thank you very much. If I may, a couple of follow-ups maybe uh, on both questions, actually. On the first question, uh, in terms of promotional activities, is it fair to assume that there's going to be a step up on promotional activity already in Q2, 
or is it something for the second half of the year? And uh, on uh, the second question, uh, in terms of uh, savings and initiatives you can put in place to further mitigate the pressure if the situation continues uh, for much longer, um, how much room do you have to take further actions versus what you have already implemented? Hi, this is uh, Adam here. Uh, looking into the uh, the markdowns and reductions, we don't foresee a big change during second quarter, but of course we are, are uh, reviewing the plans for, for third quarter here, depending on how the situation evolves. Um, so as Helena said, we have both buying and planning measures in place, but also a, a plan for how do we activate the stock uh, when trading becomes more normalized um in in the time to come um when it comes to the opex uh of course we've taken measures but we also have a um a toolbox of measures to to take uh as the situation evolves both if the lockdown period will be prolonged or as Helena also said um what do we start to do if the situation turns to the better so we're following it closely and have a toolbox of of uh of actions uh, plan going forward, if so needed. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. In the interest of time, we ask participants to ask to limit your questions to one only, please. Your next question comes from the line of Frederick Iverson. Please ask your question. Thank you. Uh, good morning, guys. Um, my question would be on the uh, on the sourcing costs um, as you start sort of buying for the winter collection and even looking into the next year. Obviously, the situation has forced you to become much more flexible. Um, so, in that sense, is it uh, is it fair to assume that your sourcing costs will come up quite significantly as we look into 2021, potentially putting some pressure on your gross margin? Thank you. Our current assessment of the sourcing costs are also, of course, very, very difficult to, to assess, both as the demand in, in the sourcing markets has uh, dramatically dropped uh, and, and some of the, uh, the external factors such as uh, input factors to, to uh, our, our products is also uh, coming down. So uh, we are not right now seeing a, a likely increase, but, but rather potential uh, uh, neutral or, or slightly sort of from, from a cost perspective positive development. But it's too early to say uh, how, how, to what extent this will affect the, uh, the uh, sourcing costs. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Magnus Roman. Please ask your question. Thank you. Uh, could you help out a little bit on the on the reductions in Q2 OPEX that you yeah, that you foresee? How how is that spread roughly over staff costs, uh, rents, and and marketing or other things? Um, looking at the uh, the guidance for for OPEX, uh, as previously mentioned, and we 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 do have a. Uh, a, uh, always the flexibility in our, our cost structures that, of course, now when a lot of stores are closed, uh, the need for, for uh, marketing uh, or rent levels is predicted to go down and also the need for, for staffing in our stores. Uh, but we're also reviewing uh, sort of the situation on local level when it comes to, to government relief packages. So... Uh, it is a combination of all, I must say, but with some, as we write, also uncertainty regarding the timing um, as, as uh, we as well as, as uh, the, the, the countries are facing a new situation here with quite big uncertainty regarding when and how much will be, be uh, attributed to, to cost savings. Your next question comes from the line of Anisha Sherman from Bernstein. Please ask your question. Hi, good morning. Um, my question is about store openings. Your estimates have come down for both openings and closures versus what you expected last quarter. On closures in particular, you um, can you shed some light on why you expect to see 45 fewer closures than what you expected a quarter ago? 
Are you seeing some significant significant rent relief on those stores that uh, that makes you change your mind on keeping them open? And does that impact your broader strategy looking ahead of dramatically reducing your um, store opening rates going forward? Thank you. Yes, as uh, of course the situation is very very complex right now and things move very fast. And this is an ongoing process. As you know, we've been revising these numbers uh, pretty often. And we have a lot of no- a lot of stores coming up for renegs and so on. And when it comes to new stores, it's obvious that we are now um, slow- slowing down the opening pace. And when it comes to closures, um, I-, I can understand that you're surprised. But when we, we look at and assess every negotiation, We've seen that we get, in some cases, even better uh, terms than we expected. So it makes sense to keep the stores open. And also, in some cases, um, a closure of the store is connected to a write-down. So it's, it's wiser to keep them open. And, and on, on top of that, we also have inventory now to sell. So it makes sense to have more stores open for that reason as well. And, and sorry to follow up. Does that does that impact your longer term strategy, or is that just a short term decision based on rent relief and write down implications? No, it doesn't change our long term uh, strategy. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Charlie Muir-Sons from McZane BNP Paribas. Please ask your question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to focus back on uh, the operating costs and your uh, target for Q2. Um, is the is that pace of uh, cost saving reflective of what you think you could achieve as a run rate going forward, or is that due to the fact that you're implementing activities now, but perhaps some of those only achieve full cost reduction towards the end of the quarter? I guess what I'm trying to drive at is, you know, are there more cost levers that will uh, bear fruit on a run rate basis as we enter Q3? Um, you know, notwithstanding perhaps the fact that revenues will, will begin to improve. Thanks. Um, it's so difficult to assess how the situation will evolve. So we have focused on, on actions uh, and, and uh, consequences of those actions uh, affecting second quarter. So uh, it's not to be taken as an assessment of the long-term flexibility in cost, but it's our best current estimate of uh, of uh, the second quarter and how that will be impacted. Great, and thank you. On inventories, you, you said that um, obviously you've been reducing your purchases quite significantly. Can you give us any kind of quantification as to how much you've managed to reduce your order book by? Um, n- n- not, not a real quantification, but of of course, as soon as we saw the magnitude of uh, the closure of stores, we, we acted immediately uh, uh, to kind of reassess our plans and uh, the quantifications and the whole purchasing uh, plans going forward. Uh, so the whole success when it comes to that will be uh, the flexibility of going down in order to so taking away or cancelling some parts. Uh, and kind of uh, also steer it to the right channel, uh, meaning then as of now the online channel, where we still have customers um, uh, who uh, w- wants to shop. Your next question comes from the line of Richard Chamberlain from RBC Capital Markets. Please ask your question. Thank you. Morning, team. Um, Just back on the OPEX as a subject, um, I'm slightly surprised that OPEX control was so good in in Q1, given the Black Friday shift and so on. Were were there any um, extra actions taken at the end of the quarter in relation to COVID-19, in particular on marketing? Um, And then does the the OPEX guidance for Q2 uh, include any IFRS 16 impacts, that 20 to 25% reduction that you Thank you. Um, for quarter one, uh, as Helena mentioned, we saw a, a continuous improvement of, uh, of uh, top line and also, of course, continuous positive effects of, of lowered stock levels that also indirectly uh, affect operating costs. So there were no extraordinary measures uh, in general during quarter one. Some, uh, of course, with the effects in, in primarily China uh, were taken, but they were 
less significant uh, during the first quarter. Uh, second quarter, there is no IFRS 16 effects in this estimate. Your next question comes from the line of Jeff Reddell from Morgan Stanley. Please ask your question. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, can I just ask a question about payments to suppliers? Are you changing your payment terms to suppliers for the inventory that's already in your system? Uh, and if not, uh, is it reasonable to assume you've got to pay something around 30 billion kroner over the next quarter to your suppliers? Um, we pay the suppliers, of course, for, for the orders that has been produced as per our contracts. And then when it comes to uh, coming orders um, uh, and uh, the orders that we uh, now cautiously start placing, uh, we do uh, find new agreements and we have new negotiations with uh, our suppliers. Your next question comes from the line of Adam Cochran from City. Please ask your question. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to say a very thorough um, report you've managed to produce in, in these uh, circumstances. And the chart on, uh, on China is probably one of the most uh, useful things I've seen in the, in the last uh, couple of weeks. And on, on China, that, is there any lessons you've learned from China that you can apply to some of the other countries as, as we're going into this? Uh, and, and as we look at China, do you think it's a relevant template for how sales may recover in other markets? Thank you. Um, when it comes to learnings uh, from China, yes, definitely that is spread uh, to other uh, markets in different ways. And first of all, I would mention it's more uh, our approach when it comes to our uh, amazing colleagues uh, and the people uh, in how to do that in the right way um, uh, when having more closed stores. But of course, also we can learn from them uh, reopening and what kind of actions uh, to take when uh, welcoming all the customers uh, back again in, in the different channels. I believe there was a second question. Did I get that right? If there was a second question. Adam. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, when, when you look at those reopenings, do you have to, um, the inventory that, that, that you had going into, um, in, into the closures, when you reopen it, are, are the customers interested in the, the same products that you have in store because it's only, uh, let's say, two months rather than six months? It, it's still the same season products, and do you just, or do you just have to give them a slight incentive to come back and, and shop? Well, I would say that we have uh, really caref carefully looked into our commercial plans in what to offer the customers. Of course, we have activated what we feel is appropriate uh, deals for our customers uh, to attract them. So, uh, slight changes in our commercial uh, uh, plan, uh, I would say. But uh, yeah, we're we're really happy uh, to see. Um, that the opening in China, welcoming the customers back with those commercial activities, uh, is slowly but surely uh, showing good recovery. Your next question comes from the line of Daniel Schmidt from Dunks Bank. Please ask your question. Yes, good morning, Helena and Adam and Nils. Uh, a question for me then. When you're uh, guiding for an operating loss in Q2, and, of course, also giving us some guidance on gross margin and operating expenses and so on. What are you implicitly assuming when it comes to the top-line development for Q2? Uh, for second quarter, then, uh, it is uh, virtually impossible to make any, any definite forecast or how this will, uh, will evolve. But, of course, we follow uh, the respective markets and the authorities uh, suggested or proposed a date for reopenings of, of some of the uh, of the uh, parts of the of the societies. So that is one of the uh, the uh, data points we use for assessing the uh, potential recovery. Uh, but as 
we all in, in this situation, it, it, it's hugely difficult to, to make any, any uh, distinct predictions. Your next question comes from the line of Anne Critchlow from Society General. Please ask your question. Good morning. Um, my question is on uh, the online um, delivery, um, because I believe you're offering free delivery on all orders at the moment. Um, is there any minimum order value, and are you doing that in all markets? I uh, think this is something we are very generous here, of course, to uh, incentivize our customers, and we are very happy that we have the online channel so we can still keep in touch with our customers, and so that's very appreciated. We, I don't have the details for all markets, sorry. Your next question comes from the line of Rebecca McKellenen from Santander. Please ask your question. Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, I also have a question on digital. Um, is the March growth, the 17% uh, local cur currency sales uh, growth in digital, is, is, was it fairly even across the month, or did um, that growth basically decline as the month progressed um, sort of alongside lockdowns and such? And also, is there any sort of major pockets of geographical demand for online, or is it just you've seen a, a typical sort of shift from bricks and mortar to online in, in most of your markets? Um, I would say that uh, uh, the turnover in our digital channel was fairly even uh, during March, of course, with some variations uh, when it comes to the different markets. Your next question comes from the loan line of Rosie Shepherd from Retail Week. Please ask your question. Hiya. So you talked about um, the rent dialogue with landlords. Can you go into a bit more detail? So what kind of arrangements have been made and what's likely to be ha happen in the future? Um, has there been a difference across Europe with the negotiations with landlords? And there are there less other lessons for the UK market to learn from? So seeing that almost... 4,000 out of our 5,000 stores uh, are uh, closed uh, and uh, with, of course, a significant decrease then in turnover. Uh, of course, for uh, the coming uh, weeks and months of rents, we will have to have uh, discussions with our partners, in the, this case with our landlords, and come uh, to new type of agreements since we will all have to kind of help each other in a crisis that affects everyone. Uh, I cannot be specific per market because this is an ongoing process uh, with uh, uh, landlords in each of the markets affected. Your next question comes from the line of Amy Donnellan from Breaking, Breaking Views. Please ask your question. Um, hi there. Um, again, it was helpful to see the data coming from China um, and just wondered what the situation was with online sales in China. Um, have they kind of, did they carry on throughout the kind of peak that you saw there or uh, is that kind of any guidance that you could give us on, on what we should expect from the other markets? Uh, online in China has had a, a fairly stable but but uh, strong uh, month of March. So uh, we don't see the same fluctuations in the uh, online demand in in China as we see on in the um, in the stores. Your next question comes from the line of Simon Irwin from Credit Suisse. Please ask your question. Um, morning, everyone. Two questions for you. Um, the first just is on, is on marketing within 1Q. I mean, as you saw things coming, did you ramp back on the cost of marketing uh, in, in the quarter uh, in the expectation that things were going to slow down? Um, and can you just talk a little bit through the uh, cash flow and the balance sheet in the quarter? Obviously, it was a strong quarter from a, uh, from, from a profit perspective, um, and yet your interest-bearing liabilities seem to have gone up quite materially in the quarter. Can you just talk us through that disparity? To start with the marketing. Uh, uh, I just start with the, with the marketing then. Uh, marketing is one of our, our more flexible costs. So uh, 
as we saw the the uh, the situation uh, develop, we we adjusted plans for for communications. Uh, so that is part of the uh, the um, cost savings. Then we have already from from uh, last year's gained a lot of learnings in in uh, how to to work with with marketing and particularly in the digital channels that we continuously apply them. So. Uh, it was not a dramatic shift, but uh, parts of, of the OPEX uh, improvements in uh, in quarter one were, were due to marketing. And when it comes to the interest-bearing liabilities, this is a pure IFRS 16 effect, uh, where we have the long-term leasing liabilities up, uh, amounting to 57 billion, which of course inflates this uh, KPI. Your next question comes from the line of James Grizzett from Jeffers. Please ask your question. Yes, good morning to all of you. Um, just a very quick one, really. Uh, how much are you looking to expand your credit facilities by, um, given what you told us on, on the press release? Um, our aim is to, to have an appropriate liqu- liquidity buffer uh, and, and preparing for... for uh, uh, yeah, any 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 uh, development of of this of this situation. So uh, it's not only the, the the credit facilities, but also of course how we steer investment, how we manage costs, uh, and how we 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 steer the buying. So we don't have a a um, a single figure for, for that part. It's a combination of all actions we do with the overarching goal to to secure an appropriate liquidity buffer. Your next question comes from the line of Jeff Lowry from Redburn. Please ask your question. Yeah, a question about uh, digital and e-com, please. Are you managing to operate your uh, warehouses and your deliveries without disruption? Um, And what measures are you taking to try and ensure that those channels remain uh, open over coming months? Thanks. Uh, Thank you for the question. When it comes to digital operations, of course, first of all, we follow the recommendations from the authorities in each market to understand and to keep on having the safety for our staff as the first uh, priority. Um, In those countries, 47 out of 51 where we uh, can, uh, we do see uh, that we uh, drive successfully some activities when it comes to uh, increased flexibilities um, uh, uh, to be able to uh, give uh, the, the service and the uh, products to the online customers going forward. Uh, we also, of course, revisit uh, to optimize the commercial activities in our digital uh, channels to meet the customers where they are and keep on delivering the best uh, uh, customer offer uh, to them. Your next question comes from the line of Bilquis Ahmed from JP Mum. Please ask your question. Hi, good morning. Um, I have two questions, please. The first is, could you just clarify whether the 20 to 25 percent decrease in COP- OPEX that you've mentioned in Q2 also includes the benefit from any um, government schemes that have already been announced in terms of, um, you know, pitting for furloughed employees, things like that. So does that num- does, does that guidance include or exclude government um, uh, assistance during this time? And the second is, just as you've been going through your transformation program. Um, could you just give us an update on how flexible the supply chain or, or the uh, purchasing side of things currently are? If you could just give at least some sort of ballpoint of lead times and, um, you know, what percentage of your um, purchasing is now on quite short lead time. So you can be very, very flexible um, to ramp up, uh, you know, new product purchase if the demand suddenly comes back, if we get this V-shaped recovery that all of us are hoping for. Thank you. If I then start with uh, the first question regarding the, the uh, OPEX guidance, it is including the currently verified uh, government relief packages. Um, and this is, as you all understand, an ongoing work to, to see how this evolves. But it is including the currently confirmed uh, government relief packages, yes. 
Uh, when it comes to the supply chain uh, flexibility, again, the most important thing for us has been to act fast and to adjust uh, our purchasing according to the uh, uh, decreased demand. Um, and that we follow uh, closely now also, of course. So without giving exact figures, we have... Uh, during this time then, of course, drastically shifted uh, in those purchasing plans uh, to be able to be flexible uh, once we can welcome customers back and start opening again. Thank you. Once again, if you wish to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone. Your next question comes from the line of Niklas Skogman from Handelsbank. And please ask your question. Yes, hi, I'd like to revisit the uh, 20 to 25% uh, potential cut to SGNA costs and the assumptions underlying that. So, uh, should we assume that, eight, you assume that April will be worse than March? And uh, because you're, you're present in so many markets, so it's, it's difficult to sort of track all the different regulations in place in all these markets. So, it would be good with some more numbers if you would be able to provide those on the underlying or, or your sales assumptions in uh, April and May. Again, as Adam and Elena said, this is extremely uh, difficult situation and very, very difficult to, to uh, talk about the future, how this would play out. And uh, we uh, things change day by day and the situation uh, changes uh, hour by hour. Um, we do everything we can, and as Elena said, we take for forceful measures here now. Um, and of course, to even talk about April at this moment is very, very difficult, and how, how the revenues will turn out. But of course, with so many stores, close to 4,000 stores closed right now, as of now, um, you know, it, it's very, very tough. Your next question comes from the line of Paul Rossington from HSBC. Please ask your question. Uh, good morning, can you hear me? Hello, good morning, can you hear me? Oh, we hear you. Yes. Yeah, I just want uh, <clears throat> one very quick question. I just want to clarify that you haven't taken any inventory markdowns or provisions uh, during the period. That's my simple question. Thank you. <clears throat> no, we haven't. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Nicholas Ekman from Carnegie. Please ask your question. Thank you. Yes, also a question on the inventory. I was a bit surprised by your comment here that you don't expect any material change in markdowns in Q2 and that the inventory should normalize when markets reopen. Uh, I thought your lead times in general were quite long and that uh, you are now basically uh, offering spring and summer garments that are not facing any demand in, uh, at all in most markets. So, can you just elaborate a bit here? Have you really managed to stop the inflow of seasonal garments already here for the spring and summer collection, or how can you be so confident that markdowns are not going to increase much in Q2? Um, try to give our view here. Uh, entering the quarter, we believe that uh, both the, the composition and the, the size of the inventory was very healthy, and uh, that has been the trend over the last couple of quarters. Uh, and of course, assessing the situation forward, the longer uh, the lockdown period will be, uh, the more more challenging the situation will will be going forward. But as Elena also mentioned, uh, we quite early, based on indication from China, also started adjust purchasing. So uh, most likely, we will have an, an inventory increase during second quarter. But um, we believe that we will mitigate uh, most of the inventory increases during third quarter with reduced purchases and uh, somewhat increased markdown levels. Your next question comes from the line of Ashley Wallace from Bofa. Please ask your question. Um, good morning. So another follow-up question on the 25% reduction in cost in the second quarter, please. Um, how much of this 25% cost reduction comes from like a rent holiday or business rate holiday, which will essentially have to repay, be repaid at a later time? Sorry. Uh, once again, could you repeat the question, please? 
Yeah, sure. So um, just in regards to the 25% reduction in your cost for the second quarter, how much of this cost reduction comes from things like rent holidays or business rate holidays, which will essentially have to be repaid at a later time, you know, as, as stores reopen? Um, in this assessment, very little. We, we have some cash flow related reliefs uh, when it comes to, for example, in Sweden, where, where some of the uh, sort of business rates and taxes are, are postponed. So those we in the cash flow uh, assessment have, have uh, sort of postponed, but not on the, on the cost side uh, as, as it looks right now. And nothing from a, from a rent perspective? Because my understanding is that a lot of um, the negotiations in some of the European markets at the moment are around rent holidays, so essentially big reduction or, or rents which are not being paid during this store closure period that potentially is repaid over the coming two years, say, as the stores reopen? Um, the, the simple uh, answer is, it, it's not, I mean, we, it, we are paying rents. It's just that we are doing, we're pausing sometimes to uh, renegotiate with the landlords. And as Adam said, uh, in, in many cases, it, it's, it's rents related to turnover. So when it comes to rent, you pay in advance in most cases. And since uh, turnover rents are based on last year's turn, uh, turnover, they are way too high in many cases. That's why we now we're paused and are now paying again at lower lower level, so to speak. So it's not about pushing something in front of us. Mm-hmm. And then maybe are you able to give us any color about like um, what portion of your rents or your um, leases are based on turnover-driven contracts? Because, again, I thought that the rent structure in Europe and the U.S. was mainly on fixed contracts, and it was Asia was more where you saw the variability in the cost base on rent. Yeah, we have a um, – uh, we've been talking about this for many years now to have a big part of uh, rent, uh, variable rent. And um, when, it look, when you look at the IFRS 16, Around half of the stores are excluded because they have either uh, the, the, the break clause within one year uh, or it's a turnover-based rents. And I would say that turnover-based rents today are roughly a third or more. Uh, and, of course, when it comes to new negotiation, negotiations, most of them have a, rent, a variable rent uh, part in the terms. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. In the interest of time, we have approximately 10 minutes left of questions. If you do wish to ask a question, please press star 1. Your next question comes from the line of Andreas Lundberg from SEB. Please ask your question. Uh, Yeah, good morning. Thank you. You might have indicated that already, but can you give more clarification on why you're not taking an inventory provision? Thank you. I think we touched upon that before, and... um Again, we want to have to show you a, a clean, uh, uh, clean Q1 as, as possible to show the underlying progress. But of course, we've been very transparent about how difficult Q1 will be. Um, Q2. Q2 will be sorry. Um, so, so that's that's the uh, the main reason. Thanks. And you have a follow-up question from the line of Magnus Rahman from Kepler Chevrolet. Please ask your question. Thank you. Uh, I have a question on the CapEx reduction that you guided for this year. Can you give any idea what investments you are are postponing here, or are you cancelling any investments? Uh, We've reviewed all uh, investments, and and, uh, based on a a couple of principles where we, uh, of course, assess the overall level and then uh, pull back in in different proportions based on on whether there are short or long-term effects. But in general terms, we are reducing uh, the number of new stores, uh, and we're also postponing some of the uh, the um, refits as markets are uh, not uh, open to be to be refitted right now then so this is the the general answer your next question comes from the line of Anne Critchlow from Society General please ask your question thank you um, are you seeing any pressure from social media or the unions in any markets to close online warehouses Um, 
I would say that following the authorities, uh, of course, they are the ones that has the best overview and can give the best recommendations. So I think to a great extent that's what many stakeholders do uh, and have a good dialogue with them uh, in, in how to deal with the situation. So I would say our first priority when it comes to where we stay open and where we have fantastic colleagues who still uh, um, kind of go to work, and, and that is really to make sure that they feel protective and that we take the right measures uh, in in that. But it seems like many stakeholders also have that kind of trust and listen to authorities' recommendations. Your next question comes from the line of Rosie Shepherd from Retail Week. Please ask your question. Rosie Shepherd from Retail Week, your line is open. Please ask your question. Sorry, I was on mute. Hi. Um, you said that um, online sales in China didn't change as much as in other markets, um, but that in um, that China's recovery could indicate the same recovery pattern for the other countries. Um, for um, other markets, do you predict a change in online versus in-store um, and where the demand will be? I think what, what we tried to say was that the uh, the uh, the shape of the recovery is different in the online channel and the store channel in China. We don't see the same pattern here, so it's been a me more even pattern in the online channel than than in yeah. the store channel. So that was the uh, intended answer. Um, in um, other markets, predicting the recovery, though, do you see um, any change in demand online versus in stores? We can see that that uh, in some markets uh, we've had a uh, transfer of of customers that previously been uh, store customers that are now also starting to to uh, buy through the the online channel. So uh, we don't have a, a good proxy for how this will evolve, uh, but we see a um, a um, a flow of of customers that used to be on, store only now into also becoming. Uh, Omni, so to say, multi-channel customers. I would add to that that we do believe that the digital shift then will uh, probably happen uh, a bit quicker uh, than before because of that, because of some customers that have not been shopping online before uh, are starting to do that now. And also, if I may add, that we see that the, the omni is what the customers want and how the channels complement each other. So store, drive, saves, uh, traffic to online and vice versa. This is very obvious. Your next question comes from the line of Anton Weilen from Bloomberg News. Please ask your question. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, what more measures would you like to see from government? in terms of release packages and so forth? Yeah, no, uh, we have uh, a dialogue uh, with the governments in several different markets, uh, often together with others and together with industry uh, associations. And uh, that's ongoing discussions uh, uh, adjusted and in, to, in the different markets where simply we believe that it's a crisis for all of us and we have to help uh, each other. Uh, so it, it really varies a lot uh, from uh, market to market in what kind of incentives uh, that we believe is, is needed and, and what discussions that we have. All right, thank you. You have a follow-up question from the line of Frederick Iverson from ABG Sendai Collier. Please ask your question. Thank you. Uh, on the inventory, um, so the stock in trade increased by three billion over the last month, and assuming that April more or less grows in line with the last month, is it sort of fair to assume that the stock can grow by a similar amount in April? Uh, we wanted to indicate the uh, the end of March figure as we, uh, uh, although we haven't closed. March fully, uh, we wanted to give you that indication, but 
as previously discussed, it, it is beyond ourselves to make a fair assessment of how April will um, will will play out. But but to the best of our ability, we have indicated at least what we can do on on the cost side. But uh, inventory. Uh, we will uh, need to come back with uh, after the, the quarter. You have a follow-up question from the line of Daniel Schmidt from Dank Bank. Please ask your question. Yes, hello again. Uh, just coming back to operating expenses and being able to reduce them by 20 to 25 percent, uh, you also write in the same paragraph that you're awaiting additional rent relief uh, is that included in that 2025 assessment? No. What we have included is the uh, already confirmed and verified uh, reliefs. So we, we, we don't want to speculate here, but rather to have uh, what we currently know. And even though, uh, as I previously mentioned as well, there is a timing uh, question here. So uh, this is to give you our, our best view of, of uh, the estimate for, for second quarter. But there's no... Uh, sort of speculative on, on what may come here. It's the confirmed levels. Your next question comes from the line of Adam Cochran from City. Please ask your question. Morning. You talked about the CapEx uh, reduction uh, mainly due to new stores and refits. Can I just ask how, how do you manage to keep going with the strategic changes that have been been so effective over the last couple of quarters, make sure that you keep on track with uh, sustainability or uh, better fashion, uh, buying, etc. as you go through this. Um, is, that, is that a real challenge to make sure that you keep the, the strategic uh, improvements going whilst you're dealing with the, the tactical challenges of, of the crisis? Thanks. Yeah, that is a very relevant question. And of course, being in a crisis, we have to uh, to shift focus so that we uh, are decisive and take the right short-term measures to adjust uh, to the situation. That does not mean that we, uh, uh, you know, put all the strategic areas or we decide not to do them. It's just about the pace, meaning that uh, some of the strategic areas and the uh, priorities will simply have to shift and some initiatives will have to be postponed. However, I would say that this crisis uh, highlights uh, the need of a really ongoing focused work, uh, sometimes even accelerated work in some strategic areas. Uh, for example, when we now see the digital shift and many customers uh, who have been shopping physical stores, now going to online, and the uh, need for the Omni experience uh, I would highlight. And of course, also strategies going forward when it comes to making sure we're a sustainable business with uh, different uh, revenue streams, which is another part uh, that is important for us where we still keep on working, but again, it's about the pace. In the interest of time, we have time for one more question. The question comes from Chiara Botstani from JP Morgan. Please ask your question. Hi, thank you. Just a very quick follow-up one. Uh, on your online um, online performance in March, I was just wondering if you could strip out Germany or actually comment on the Germany performance or to what extent the replatforming last year as um, as what well, the implications of the replatforming of Germany last year have on, uh, on the March performance this year in terms of comp base. Thank you. Right. I think uh, it's in particular when you look at the Q1 numbers where you see the very strong online plus 44, where, of course, Germany played a big role. Where we, we did the platform transition last year, which held us back. And this year, of course, the comps were easier. For uh, Q uh, for, for March number, um, I mean, Germany was in line with expectations and, and with the other markets and doing better. And, of course, the new platform gives our customers an even better customer experience. Thank you. That does conclude our conference for today. Thank you for participating. You may all disconnect.